just after David tells you not to fall asleep, I'm like, you know, let's turn down the lights, let's take a rest. No. So I was really excited when David and Tom approached me about lecturing to you all. I haven't lectured in the undergrad in a lot of years, but I was an engineer, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story, transition a little bit about hepatology and where sometimes you're sitting there in the seat and you're sort of thinking, what am I learning? Why am I learning this? What is it going to help me in the future? Well, let me tell you my story and see if it resonates with you and where you might end up in the future or just a possible path for all of you. So I always start with learning objectives when I teach at the medical school. Um, is that in the undergrad? Is that kind of how you guys focus around learning objectives or not so much? Okay. So learning objectives, I hope you understand potential career paths in biomedical engineering. You can differentiate clinical versus research-related patient care. Understand some hepatology. I'm not expecting you to learn all of hepatology. That's not the point of BME. Um, apply principles of BME into medical advances. And then we're going to talk about some different areas within hepatology and within my practice that, you know, I have colleagues that think like physicians who think about these problems, but I sometimes come at it from a different lens because of my engineering background. That's where I think it's helpful for you all to sort of realize where you might go in the future. So I've had a few stops along the way. I don't know if people recognize if they don't. I'll talk through them, though. So I started at Cornell, and I was a double major, chemical and biomedical engineering, graduated, and then I went to med school from there. I went to med school, so I went from Ithaca, New York. I went to New York. I went to Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and I was um, in the Bronx for, in Manhattan for four years, so in New York. And then I wanted to try another city. I came to Washington, D.C. That was GW Hospital. So I did my residency in GW Hospital. And then I went to Boston and trained at Lady Clinic in gastroenterology. Then I came to UVA to do transplant hepatology and then start as a faculty member. So it's a long road. You might be here. You might end up down here. You might go a different path along the way. But there's a lot of potential. And one thing I will tell you that I really found for all of you sitting in here, and uh, how many of you are engineering majors? Or is everyone basically an engineering major? OK. Um, I found that when I was interviewing for med school, they liked engineers. And I, you know, your grade point average might be a little bit lower than someone that's doing pre-med. But on the flip side, you think you're a problem solver. And that's what medicine is. You get a problem. You get a patient who comes in with a problem. And you're solving a problem. You're trying to find the diagnosis. So just yesterday, I went and saw a patient. And it was literally like dissecting the whole history. And there were, there were patterns and things that you know, I, I picked up with the other fellow I was working with. And I think if we didn't look at it from that lens of looking back through, looking for patterns, looking for where bumps along the road and where things happen, um, everyone was sort of looking at it from their different silos. And they sort of missed the big picture. And that's where I think engineering teaches you sometimes to take a step back and look at it from a big picture point of view without losing focus of the details. So what did I do? I did chemical and biomedical engineering. So, um, so, and none of you are chemical engineers, I'm assuming. Um, so chemical engineering is one of those majors where, and maybe you have friends that are chemical engineers, chemis, and our, you know, our senior year was process design, unit ops lab, and I mean, I was like in the unit ops lab, I was designing a methyl tert butyl ether um, chemical plant and refinery that we were working for. They actually brought in CEOs from companies who, who critiqued our presentations. I was doing reactor design and for drug development because I was also doing biomedical engineering. And I was doing all that sitting in a computer lab like that one in front of a computer until like 2 o'clock in the morning and getting back there at 8 o'clock in the morning to finish up your presentation for that next day for presenting your process design. I kind of had this aha moment at one point where it was that I think it was one of those, I still, you know, you, there's some times in your life where you remember a moment, and this was one of those times. I remember that moment. I remember that we were presenting the next day. There was a CEO of this one petroleum company who's based in Malaysia was coming to hear a presentation about MTBE reactor and this process that we had designed. And I'm sitting there at 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm running simulations. And I'm, getting, I'm not getting the outputs I need. And it's like, you're just like, I'm almost just ready to throw my hands up and be like, 
what am I doing here, right? Because I was like, I want to help people, but what am I helping people by like designing and refining petroleum? I was sort of, it was like one of those moments where I was like, this is not for me. But I'm not saying that that's bad. I mean, I have friends that went on and did that, but I was just like, I want to help people. I want to work with people and I don't want to be in front of a computer all the time. So I made that decision at that point, which was a little bit, I mean, a little bit late, but I was like, you know what? I want to go into medicine and or because I had done biomedical engineering so I want to go into medicine so um, this is where it sort of became comes a little different you're like directly talking to patients you're working with nurses and other staff you're doing procedures and that's kind of why I wanted to gastroenterology because we also do procedures so you might say what's your connection with biomedical engineering and actually I I've done since my I've been here for 10 years on faculty in the medical school and I've actually collaborated with a lot of biomedical engineers. One has actually left the university, started a company, and they're actually now um, based out of Raleigh in the Research Triangle down in North Carolina, and they have a company going on with a device that we help, I help design. Um, so you, does anyone recognize this hallway? Anyone know this hallway? So this is that link between Penn Hall and MR5, if you don't recognize it. And the reason I put this on is this was my aha moment at UVA. I was walking through this hall, and you know the set of stairs, right where you guys have that awesome Friday happy hour, and all of us in medicine are like looking in there, be like, I wish I was a biomedical engineer, right? Because you guys have that on Fridays. I think you even have alcohol there, or is that uh, is that the grad students? Oh, sorry, forget it. Oh, forget everything I said. Forget everything I said. That's why I'm getting a lot of blank stares. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, we're all like walking by and everyone's like looking over there. Gosh, I wish I could do that. So Arlen, you, you know what? Subtle plug for UVA grad school. Yeah, yeah, just all the faculty and all the fellow or all the PhDs are hanging out and it's like, wow, that's a cool set of people anyway. So, um, uh, so scratch that and you can delete that from the recording, Tom. Um, but the reason I put that up is there's that set of stairs that goes down, actually comes down here, right over here, right next to it. And there's always these postings that are up there. Um, people tape stuff onto the board, some lectures, this or that. And the reason that I put that up is because how many of us walk through the halls and we're looking at our phone, trying to do that last email, trying to look at the last post of something that came up, maybe looking at a Twitter feed. And I think that happens to all of us, right? We're in busy lives and we're trying to like be efficient while we're walking. Um, this kind of taught me that you know you got to look up and look around and look at your surroundings. And one day, I think it was nine years ago, um, I was walking down those set of stairs right over there, and I saw a posting for a Grand Rounds lecture in biomedical engineering. And I was like, oh wow, that's kind of interesting. And I read it and said, use of ultrasound to measure viscosity of fluid. I was like, oh, okay. I'm sure hundreds of people from the medical school or from the medical facility walked past that, didn't think much of it, and kept walking. Um, what was really cool about it was I thought about it, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go to that. I'm interested. I have an engineering background. There's something that I'm interested in in medicine, which is how blood coagulates in my liver disease patients. Blood coagulation is like viscosity of fluid. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to go to it. So I went to the Grand Rounds, the lecture. It was in the library right over here. And of course, everyone's like looking at me, who's this weird guy who just showed up at the lecture? And I said, oh, you know, I introduced myself, and then they were very interested in me all of a sudden. I was like this different person in the group. And I heard the lecture, heard about it. We ended up talking. I talked to the person that gave the lecture, and we ended up coming up with a possible idea for a project. That was nine years ago. We kind of, I, we kind of met a couple times. I engaged some of my other colleagues that didn't think like engineers but have... Um, context of knowing about coagulation in blood and liver disease patients. And we met a couple times with the biomedical engineers. We had great discussions. And we ended up like submitting an NIH grant. And we didn't get it. We, let me give you the, the story. We didn't get funded the first time around. But the second time around, we got funded for an SBIR, which is a Small Business Institute Research Grant. And that all came from that moment, if I was to define that moment, that aha moment of like walking down the steps, not looking at my phone and checking my email, which I do, I admit, but just seeing that posting and thinking outside the box a little bit where 
maybe viscosity can apply to my patients. So I just use that as an example for you all, just from this hallway that was, that was kind of influential in my career. So what is, the other thing that I found is that you all sit in a very powerful position when you talk to medicine people. Now you might say, well, medicine is where, you know, people are helping, helping patients directly. That's where funding goes for the NIH and stuff like that or grants. But what the NIH is looking for now is translational research. Who's heard that term before, translational research? Raise your hand if you've heard that term before. So translational research is something that I learned a lot about after I got to um, became faculty. Translational research is literally taking that research that you do, these projects that you had for getting the gloves out from the, from the fox's den or whatever it was, to taking it to designing something that will end up getting something out or designing a product that would get something out from a baby that's sleeping that because you don't want to wake them up with fear of like sleep apnea or they're sleep deprived, right? Something like that. So taking what you're doing on the bench and working it to the bedside. That's what translational research is to me. Now it might be different to other people, but that's what it is to me. And it is the whole point of taking this idea of this, that idea I told you about viscosity of fluid, taking it and translating it to blood and how blood clots, and then taking it to think about how can we make that better for patients that can't do that well, and helping those people so they don't bleed out on the table and they don't die in front of you, you don't have to turn around and tell their family member that they've died because they bled out. So I think that's where it goes from taking it from the bench to the bedside where you're directly helping people. So there is a lot of focus about funding in healthcare where we want to improve care, but we want to be more cost efficient with our care, where we want, you know, money to be used, but to be used properly. And there's less money to go around, but at least we can focus our efforts and a lot more personalized care and focused care. So how do engineers think? We think about being efficient, right? How do medicine people think? They think about just treating people, right? I mean, I, I'm using it as an extreme example, but putting those two things together is where I think the future of medicine lies. I'm going to get through a couple different topics, and then at, I'm going to, at the end, I'm going to go back to them to try to give you some questions to answer or to think about for the next week. Um, there are going to be some materials that if you haven't already gotten, you will get the handouts um, about liver diseases and clinical diseases. I don't expect you, we don't expect you to learn all that stuff. Those are actually the handouts that I use in the medical school, so those are for medical students, just so you know. And so what we want to do is we want to introduce you to some concepts or some ideas and some things you can research so when you come back a week later, we can have a longer discussion about these things. So from this, autoimmune hepatitis, that's a disease process in the liver, an autoimmune process where your own immune system is battling your liver. It all of a sudden doesn't recognize your liver, it starts attacking your liver, and then um, you start having liver failure from it. So in the handouts that you get, I want you to read a, a little bit about autoimmune hepatitis. What is that disease? What is the pathophysiology and how do you treat it? Okay? So focus in on that. The reason that I want to bring this up and next week we'll talk about it a little more is that we want to suppress the immune system but there are very limited options for this, for treatment of autoimmune hepatitis. So I think if we focus on that, I'm giving you real life problems. Everything I'm presenting to you here are real life problems and things that people struggle with in medicine every day. Diagnostic dilemmas. Diagnostic dilemmas, it's about, this is not so much in the materials that I've included to you, but liver transplant. So we do a lot of liver transplants here at UVA. We're actually one of the biggest on the East Coast, which people don't realize. I don't know if you, how many liver transplants do you think we do in a year? How many do people think? How many? Who thinks like zero to 10? 10 to 30, okay, 30 to 50, 50 to 70, 70 to 90, so we do about 100, we do 100. There was one week last month that we did five liver transplants in one week, five, so every day we were doing a liver transplant, we were transplanting a liver. Now you might say a small town like Charlottesville, and I'll get to that a little bit later, why that's important, 
but there's no other academic center that does liver transplant all the way down to the Tennessee border in West Virginia completely or down to the North Carolina border. Other academic centers. Yes, question. When you do a liver transplant, do you do like take a whole liver or do you do like just a portion of it? Both. So that's, that, that's a very good question. Um, but the liver can actually regenerate. So you can do a partial liver and then it will grow to fill the space, to fill and become a whole liver. So we do both though. It depends. Um, yes? Say that again? Have you been able to use stem cell research? Oh, today? stem cell research, yeah. No, so not yet. It's not to that point. I mean, they, I think they may be doing it like in science or in the bench, but not, not to the point of, um, I think, you know, there's a lot in medicine that we know, but a lot more that we don't know. And that, that skeleton or that structure, that scaffolding for cells to be in a liver and have ducts and blood vessels all into it, I don't think we figured all that out yet. Um, but one thing I want to tell you about this. So if people are using alcohol and they're, they have alcohol use disorder, then we, we don't transplant them. There's two reasons. One, it's not just to be punitive to punish them because they were drinking alcohol, but one reason is, is a, something that we just talked about with one of the questions, is that <clears throat> the liver can regenerate. So we don't want to transplant a liver in someone who can actually have some of their liver regenerate if they just stop drinking alcohol. So we want to give their liver a chance to recover. The other reason is, is it's a limited resource. So if you think about it, if you give some, a liver to someone who is drinking, who goes back to drinking, you can imagine that not only are you, you might be saving, but you might not be saving that person's life because they may damage that liver, but you're taking away from somebody else who potentially could get saved, right? If it was an unlimited resource, I'd be having a very different discussion. So there's this ethical dilemma because when we talk to patients, getting back to distilling back to the question I want you to think about over the week is, when we talk to patients, we have to ask them, are you drinking? How much are you drinking? Now, that's sort of a conflict of interest, right? If you ask me, and I'm sitting here, and I know that my answer to you will decide if you're going to give me a liver transplant or not, if I answer truthfully and I say, I'm actually drinking like a 12-pack a day, you know, 12 beers a day and a, you know, pint of vodka, you know, um, then they'd be like, you know, believe it or not, that was an answer I got not too long ago. Um, was, you know, if they tell me that, then I'm like, you know what, we can't give you a liver transplant. Do you think people are going to be truthful with me? Probably not, right? I mean, it's not in their best interest. But on the flip side, could it actually then create problems down the line where if they're not truthful with me and we do transplant their liver, then not only have we sacrificed somebody else's life, but we may potentially not give them a chance to succeed. Go ahead. Does someone need to be fully sober for their liver to regenerate? Or is there like a like a sustenance dose of alcohol they can take so they can kind of like maintain it for a long time. So the question is, is does someone need to be fully sober or cleared of alcohol for their liver to regenerate or can some small amount of alcohol? From what we know, any alcohol, it detoxifies in the liver. So the liver cells are working towards that instead of trying to build new cells. So probably needs to be clear of alcohol completely. So my last, th this gets to the question in this whole scenario is, so there's, there are these new assays, phosphatidyl ethyl ethanol, everyone calls it PETH, P-E-T-H. Um, it detects moderate to heavy alcohol use in liver transplant recipients. So this is still in sort of research phasing, but this is a diagnostic dilemma. Now this would be doing me some favors too. I think we should look at PETH and see what is that test, how does it work, what is it measuring, to detect alcohol, is it accurate? Because the accuracy is probably very important in this case, right? Because it has big ramifications if someone's going to be turned down for a liver transplant or accepted on the liver transplant list. So I, let's look at that for next week, and I'll set that on your agenda. What is an objective measure, something that people can't fake? Medical devices. One thing, one reason I went into GI is because we do devices, and I love doing it brings me back to my engineering. We work with machines and we do devices. So upper endoscopy is where we take a scope, a fiber optic scope with a camera and a light source. We go down, look in the stomach, look in the first part of the small intestine. 
If you have liver disease, this is one of the things I want you to look up for the next week. It's called varices. V -A, um, v -A -R -I -C -E -S. So it's written there. It's actually on the next, it's on the next slide in bigger font. Varices. So look up varices in the materials that you get related to cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is scarring of the liver. If you look up varices and cirrhosis, what can happen is these varices can bleed. We end up having to treat them, whether we put, we actually put rubber bands, small rubber bands on them with a device called a bander, a, a variceal band ligator, they call it a ligator, or we sclerose them. Usually sclerosis, I, I won't even talk about that because it's fallen out of favor. There are more side effects that we found, but banding is, band ligation is what we do. So the reason I bring this up is I think there's, and I'll, I'll show these videos next time, but what happens when you get down and one of these varices, one of these blood vessels right here is bleeding. You can see right here, right here, this is a, this is a stream of blood coming out. And this is one of those varices. When it's bleeding and you get down there with a scope, you get what we call a red out, where there's so much blood because it's in this column, this cylinder called an esophagus, and it can't clear out fast enough because the outflow track is small enough that it's coming out at such a pace that you get down there in the camera and you can't see anything. So I can't see. In this one, we got a good picture, and we were able to see that lesion where it's bleeding from. So we could try to put a band around it. But can you imagine if it's all red, you don't really know where you're going to start treating. Do you have a question? I have a question. Okay, so in this one it kind of shows it, but it's, the lighting is not great, but you get down there and it's just like red and bubbles and you can't really see anything. So um, that was one of the devices, but this also stems into medical education. And the reason I say medical education is, for me, I try to teach people what they, what they can do and what are some rescue therapies when people are bleeding so profusely. And there's something called a Blakemore tube. And a Blakemore tube is a tube that goes down. There's a gastric or a stomach balloon, an esophageal balloon. And what we do is we blow up these balloons, and then we pull it with a kilogram weight. And so it's pulling out of their nose. It's on traction because that balloon doesn't move. It's at the bottom of the connection of the esophagus and the stomach. And what it does is it tamponades the blood vessel so it doesn't bleed anymore. And it's sort of a temporizing measure until we can surgically fix that. So. It's, it's hard for us to train people how to do this. The reason is, is people have bleeding and they have these variceal bleeds, but we're usually able to control it. And if we can't control it, then, you know, we, we put in this too. But most of the time we're able to control it or, I mean, I hate to be dark about it, or the person dies and we, you know, there is no control over it. Yeah, they bleed out. So right now, what, uh, the reason I put this mannequin up is this was something set up, these are supposed to be lungs. That tube that you see in is people to learn practice putting airways in. And what we do is we, we practice, and can you see that red tube right over here that's right here that someone's pulling right there? That's that Blakemore tube. Oops. This really isn't a great model to teach, but you can't teach in the real life scenario because it's such a rare thing. And also the stakes are so high at that moment that I don't really want to teach a trainee at that moment. Like, I do let them try, but at some point I'm sort of like, okay, that's it. You get one shot and that's it because I've got to put this in and we've got to stop this bleeding. So you get one shot and that's it. But if they could be trained better at it, if we could develop more physiological and more accurate models that mimic what we would see in real life rather than this mannequin that was developed for breathing tubes and we sort of jerry-rigged it to be for Blakemore tubes, that would be helpful. Yeah? So for the current method with the mannequin, is there no, like if all that's happening with the like student that's trying to use this is that they're just inserting the balloon but they don't like know if they're doing it right or not and you can't see it? What's like the biggest limitation with this? And we'll get to that next week. Okay. I, I like where you're going and that's exactly the problem is like, what are the limitations? What's going to make it most lifelike? What, what do you see at the bedside? Because a mannequin, you're not going to be able to peel back someone's skin and look underneath, right? That's just not realistic. So let's design something that allows us to do that, but then you cover it up and you can't see it. The last thing I'm going to talk about is systems operations. Now, um, so 
one thing, this is so, Charlottesville is in the middle here, in the, right there, if you see, Charlottesville. And I told you that we do, um, I just knocked down someone's gloves, anyway, so, um, someone's project. So, you might say, where do we pull our patients from? Well, we pull them from this area. Bigger than you would think, right? There's no other dedicated liver center in this area except us. So, we pull from 4 million people about. Even in the small town of Charlottesville, that's why we're able to do about 100 liver transplants a year. And my patients can come from as far away as six hours away to come see me for a 20-minute appointment. That's not because I'm special, I'm great. It's because we're the only center within that, within that time period. So one thing that we transplant all these people, we have to take care of these people after the transplant. We have to make sure they don't develop diabetes, high blood pressure, get heart attacks, but it's hard to manage someone that's six hours away. I'll be honest with you, it's, it's, it's a tough part of my practice of taking care of these patients. Now, I did a study that showed that we don't, we don't do it that well, and I don't think many centers do it that well. Centers that probably are in cities do it better because they're able to see their patients a lot quicker and they're able to come, but being in a, I, I, we're in a rural setting, right? We're in the middle of farmlands and stuff, and so people come here from far away but getting them back here, people sometimes don't even have the gas money to drive that far, if you think about it. So, the, but the local, let me, the other side of it is the local doctor is always afraid of these patients because they're all of a sudden have a liver transplant and they don't want, they're like, I don't want to touch anything, I don't want to mess anything up. But we can't really manage them, but they're afraid to manage them. So, I mean, why can't we come up with a system, a better system of wireless health Using the electronic medical record, everyone has a smartphone, or if they have a computer or not, even if they don't have a computer, they have smartphones. Can we come up with a system that helps people balance? What are the questions like, oh, maybe the local doctor doesn't have electronic medical record the same as UVA is able to invest in. But then how do we communicate between different medical records? How do we communicate with people, at two busy people, that are two doctors that are busy practices? They have a chance, can we post a note, can they pull it down, is there an easy way to communicate through a smartphone or through an app or through a web-based design that's secure because of the health information that you're transmitting back and forth? All these questions and issues. So I think that's where I want to end, is that there are a lot of real-life problems. Those are real-life problems from today. Like, I sat down with David and Tom, and like we came up with these problems. I'm like, this is what we're facing today, and this is where I think you all have such a valuable role in this process, is that you think like engineers. We can build something together, and I think there is this, actually, the Center for Engineering Medicine, which I know David's very involved in. Um, are you involved in this? In the... I'm, on, I'm on the funding committee, but it's oh. really Jeff Holmes. Okay. Uh, Dr. Holmes is the main uh, person uh, in DME. And, um... So he's on the funding committee, though, so he's very involved. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. So, <laughs> but I liked, I liked the, the centers that, at the top, engineering-powered medicine. I think that's a pretty powerful statement, and I think where engineering and medicine can come together and be better for our patients. That's all I have for you. So I left you with some questions for next week, and um, we'll go from there. So can we take a couple questions? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm free. The next piece. Um, so a couple questions for Dr. Shaw. Everything is totally clear. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned like trans translational research. <clears throat> what kind of jobs are like? Is that what you see with doctors these days, or kind of what? What other jobs do you do with translational research? Like the industry. How much does industry do like from the bench to the to the other side, or is it only in, like grad school? That, 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 that. You no. Know, so it's a good question. I mean. Industry is very involved in developing all those, all those novel devices or drugs at the bench, but they can't sell those. They're not worth anything unless they can sell them to patients, and that's when they need that's when they need physicians to say, you know what, yeah, we're willing to take on this study because I think it will help my patients. Let me look at the what is the mechanism of this. Is there a potential, like, let me think about it from the whole, not just from the aspect of that, what that drug is treating, but will it affect something else in the patient? Will it make me treating their diabetes harder or not? Will it make, will it make them 
you know, more confused at times? Well, does it affect their neurological function? So, and then applying it and taking it and testing it on patients. That's where you need to have a physician with a patient population that's able to like sort of trial these things. You have, you know, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamic trials, safety trials first, before you get to anywhere near treating them on a whole group of patients. You might have just a few patients where their blood is drawn every hour to check every level to make sure it's safe. Yeah. Uh, how involved in this kind of thing are you if you're like a doctor and you're running your own private practice or, um, you know, a lot of doctors like to run their own private practice instead of um, going to a hospital or something? Yeah. So there, there is a branch point in medicine where you have to decide if you want to do practice, private practice. And do people know what that means, private practice? Of uh, being like a doc, like you might see a private practitioner, like versus an academic physician, and and th that branch point comes after your training, where you kind of have to decide that path. Um, I've obviously chosen one path. There are some people here who mainly their main practice is more clinical than research focused, and so they might not be in private practice. They might do a little bit of research, but not not to the depths that I may do it. Take one more question, and then. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you said there's ethical dilemmas with like a Costco recipient being an alcohol user. Yeah. What about someone that has like genetic NASH or like a family history of NASH um, and they need a transplant? Totally different. Different. Yeah. I mean, we can, um, people, there's a bunch of liver diseases. That, that's one of the things when patients come and see me, they're like, how can I have liver disease? I never drank a drop in my life. But there are a lot of genetic predisposition to liver diseases or even um, something like fatty liver disease. Uh, now, if I can take one more minute to just another ethical dilemma, if I could throw another one back at you. People have said, well, if someone's obese and they have fatty liver disease and we transplant them and they continue overeating and they develop NASH or fatty liver in this new liver, isn't that just like going back to drinking? How is that any different? And you start having these ethical discussions about just because it's okay to eat, eat like sweets and it's not illegal, or it's not even illegal to drink alcohol, right? It's just so overindulge, but they're overindulging and that's their vice. And that gets, there's a lot of discussions and a lot of ethical discussions that happen at our National Liver Meeting about that, that people need to really meet with a nutritionist before they go through a liver transplant. Um, those ethical elements actually, um, I think that's one of the great things about this class is that we bring it to the forefront and I think that's one of the big differences between a lot of the engineering some of the other engineering classes is you know sometimes everything is done in a lab everything's so cut and dry in calculations but when you have a physician who is seeing a patient and that patient has a family history has other elements you know of care and other concerns it, it makes everything a lot more complicated um, so I encourage you all to actually ask those things whether it's genetic predispositions, familiar history, um, behavioral elements. Um, th those are great questions. I think those are important questions for engineers, especially biomedical engineers, to, to struggle through um, because the answer is not always obvious. In medicine, even at the highest levels, right? Top transplant center, East Coast, nationally, world, there are like real issues that Dr. Shaw and his colleagues you know, struggle with. Um, so great discussion. We're going to um, build on this um, for you and go towards the assignment.